And I don't think it's been an accident, given all of the world events and things that uh, we started in the book of Isaiah last week. Uh, because that's talking about, we talked about in terms of it being the, uh, the decline of the kingdom of a, of a nation and the need or the rise of the Messiah, the hope of that messianic kingdom. You know, Isaiah is one of the, the most important of the Old Testament prophets. It's quoted, he is quoted, Isaiah is quoted as one of the prophets more, over, more often than anybody else in the New Testament. But we looked at this, these things about it, you know, his name means salvation of Adonai. And he was living, he was ministering, really, around from 740 B.C. to 700 B.C. This is during the divided kingdom. So after David and Solomon, all those guys, uh, he, he was the one that was there in Judah, in Jerusalem, and he witnessed the destruction of the northern kingdom by Assyria, a superpower of the day, in 722 B.C. Uh, if you want to read up on some of the events during his ministry, you look at 2 Kings chapter 15 through 21 or 2 Chronicles 26 through 33. Uh, we looked at he's a contemporary to Hosea and Micah. And there's uh, these other prophets had already completed most of their ministry already. So he is coming in the midst of all of that. So when Isaiah started his ministry in 740, he started where both the northern and the southern kingdoms were still active. They were still functioning, though the northern had fallen off the deep end a little bit more than the southern. Now he described that situation with the divided kingdoms as, as if he was having two sons. In chapter 1, he said, uh, Listen, heavens, and hear, O earth, for Adonai has spoken. Sons I have raised and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. You know, he is calling heaven and earth to witness, to testify about this situation. And he has raised them up. He has brought them up. He has elevated them. And yet they are rebelling against him. One of them, the northern kingdom, again, it, went, it had already gone off the deep end, right off the bat under the leadership of Jeroboam. He set the pattern for all those kings that followed him. He set the pattern even, really, for what the early church did after the first century or so when they wanted to do in separating from anything with a Jewish foundation or flavor to it. You know, in 1 Kings chapter 12, he was concerned because as the kingdom was divided, everybody was still wanting to go down to the southern kingdom for the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and he was losing his population. In fact, most of the Levites also went down to the southern kingdom. But he says, if this people keep going up to offer sacrifices in the house of Adonai at Jerusalem, then the heart of these people will turn back to their Lord, to King Rehoboam of Judah. Then they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam of Judah. So this was his idea. This is what he was going to do to stop all of that population decline. So the king sought counsel and made two golden calves he said to them you have been going up to jerusalem long enough here are your gods O israel who brought you up out of the land of egypt that sounds very familiar doesn't it same kind of thing that was said in the exodus period it says then he set up one in bethel and the other he put in dan so further north now this thing became a sin for the people, for they went for the people went to worship before the one even up in Dan. He also made shrines on the high places and appointed priests from among the people, and he had to do that because of why they were not sons of Levi. Why? Because all the Levites had already left, right? Most of them had anyway. So then Jeroboam instituted a festival in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, imitating the festival that is in Judah. He went up to the altar that he built in Bethel, the sacrifice to the calves that he had made. He installed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he had made. Then he went up to the altar 
which he had made in Bethel on the 15th day in the eighth month, in the month that he had made up from his own heart and made up a festival for the children of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. So when you look at what Jeroboam did, the sin of Jeroboam, he changed the location of worship. We've talked about this before. He changed who could be the priests, right? He took away the qualifications of being a Levite or a descendant of Aaron. He changed the feast days. He changed the holidays. He changed the calendar. Following that pattern, following that leadership of sin is what led the northern kingdom's downfall in 722 B.C. at the hands of Assyria. And all the kings that followed Jeroboam were all described and judged based on whether they continued with the sin of Jeroboam or broke from his leadership, right? Y'all follow me on that? And again, what did the early church do? Did they change the location of worship from Jerusalem? Yeah, it got pulled away to go various places, vied for it at one point or another. Jerusalem was destroyed in about 130, but it eventually ended up in Rome. They changed who could be priests. They didn't depend on a Levitical line. And they began to change the feast days and the holidays. And that's a concerning trend that it's following in this same pattern of Jeroboam. Because it tells me that anything that's built on that kind of pattern, you know, continuing in the sin of Jeroboam, what's, what's God going to do with that? Is he gonna, first, is he going to try to correct that? Yeah, he's going to try to correct that. And if they refuse correction, if they refuse to repent, what happens to it? It's eventually going to be destroyed. See, he is constantly sending his prophets to correct his people with the hope that there's going to be that teshuva, that repentance to him and his ways. But if there is no repentance, judgment eventually comes. Second Chronicles 24, 19 says, Adonai sent prophets to them to bring them back to him. And although they admonished them, they would not listen. Although the prophets admonished the people, the, the people would not listen. This was spoken to the southern kingdom of Judah. And this happened, that he kept sending the prophets to get them to turn back to him, even after they had watched the northern kingdom of Israel fall. I mean, you're seeing somebody go down into the, the gutter of their life and destroy and lose everything. And you look at that and you say, man, those guys, that's awful. That's terrible to see. I think I'm going to go in that way. Does that make sense? To follow right behind what you've already seen destroy somebody else's life. Isaiah even watched this happen for 18 years of his ministry. He'd already been seeing their decline for some time, but if it started, his ministry started in 740 and Israel fell in 722, he got to see it and watch it. Isaiah was one of those prophets that God had sent to them to warn the southern kingdom to try to bring them back. to warn them not to think too highly of themselves, thinking that what happened to them could never happen to us, right? And they looked at it, they thought that of themselves. You know, God would never do that to us because we have the right place of worship. You know, we have the, the right priesthood. We have the right calendar and the right feast days, Right? And they had all of those things, and were they still doing wrong in the eyes of the Lord? Were they doing everything right in the eyes of the Lord, even though they had the right place, the right priests, and the right calendar? Yeah, no, they, they had all that, and they were still doing wrong. They were not exempt from God's correction to admonish them. To where we looked at last week in chapter 1, 
you know, he says, look, bring no more worthless offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Shabbat, the calling of convocations. I cannot endure it. Iniquity with solemn assembly. Your new moons and your festivals my soul hates. They are a burden to me, and I am weary to bear them, not because they weren't doing it at the right time or at the right place with the right priest. It was not because of any of those things, but because of what was going on in here within them. He says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you multiply prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So there was this kind of problem even in the southern kingdom. And it was such a problem that they were following in the same path to where he even said to both of them at this point in chapter in verse 16, he says, wash and make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good Seek justice, relieve the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And then he says, which is a verse that we see so often, Come now, let us reason together, says Adonai. Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they will become like wool. That's what Isaiah is trying to convince them of, is that this is really the heart of God. It's repentance and forgiveness and restoration. He knows that we don't do everything right. And yet, this is what he seeks from us. Let's talk about it. Let's acknowledge what's wrong and make correction. See, Judah thought they could point the finger at the obvious sin of the corruption of the other guys of Israel, thinking they were okay but God had already said that both sons, both kingdoms were rebelling against him. So even when Judah's kings were even relatively good, especially in comparison to the northern kings, they even they still were not perfect in, the, in Adonai's eyes. One such king is, is the guy that's very important in the book of Isaiah. In 1 Kings chapter 15, it says, In the 27th year, of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, became king. It says he was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. It says now he did what was right in Adonai's eyes, just like all that his father Amaziah had done. And that's a good thing, right? You want that to be said of you. You want that to be said that you were doing right in the Lord's eyes. But there's a however. The high places were not taken away. The people were still sacrificing and burning incense on the high places. So even though Azariah was described as doing what was right, he did a lot of good. There were still some things that he neglected, that he failed to do, and he failed to do all that he could have done. Right? We've seen leadership like that before. They're doing a lot of good things, and they're stumbling in certain important places. Even good kings and rulers can fail to do all the good things they need to. They can even do some bad things. Presidents governors, pastors. Even good kings have a hard time stopping this downward spiral of a nation. How many of y'all remember in 2016, everybody talked about the election of Trump not as a stopping of the judgment of God, but more as a reprieve, right? Y'all remember that? It didn't stop, did it? The spiraling down of the nation. They may delay it. They may slow it down. But it still is coming. And you may look at that and think, you know, I may not know a whole lot about Azariah. 
because that's one of the challenges in the scriptures in the bible is that sometimes that makes it difficult to follow that has to do with names you know sometimes the same name is used for multiple people at multiple times but in this case king azariah has a different name entirely in other places in the scriptures he's better known as uzziah and he shows up in chapter 6 of isaiah where it says you know in the king in the year of king uzziah's death that's the same guy He's been he's been on the throne. He's been in the lead for some 52 years. This is a pretty significant moment in their history. He he shared his rule with his father at first. So they were co-regents is what they called it. He even shared it with his son for the last 10 years or so. He actually he died in 740 B.C., the year that Isaiah's ministry starts. So. Chapter 6 is kind of like hearing Isaiah's call to the ministry. And in starting in the year that Uzziah died, he's starting in this time period of of, of uncertainty of which way are are things going to go. But when you look at uh, Uzziah and his reign, he's a bit of a mixed bag. He he was said to be a good king. He was one who, this is the really interesting thing about it. He was a good king. But he was also one that at the end of his life was not allowed to go into the temple at all. He had to live in in separate housing outside the palace. This is after he'd been doing a lot of good things. He was building up Judah's military, leading several successful campaigns against the Philistines, against the Ammonites. His, His fame was spreading in the region. Uzziah, he, you know, he provided an upgrade in all of their military equipment. He, he serves as an example of why even nations with good kings can still be in decline. And the reason is because pride will go before fall. In 2 Chronicles 26, again, you look at those, those sequences to, to see the time period that Isaiah is ministering in. This is talking about Uzziah or, or Azariah. It says, but when he became strong, when he'd been doing all this good stuff and building up his power base, his heart grew so haughty that he acted corruptly. For he trespassed against Adonai his God by entering into the temple of Adonai to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Is that a good idea? Because who's the only ones that's supposed to be allowed to do that? The priests, the Levitical priests, the Aaronic priesthood, all of that. You know, there's a certain order. Even the king was not supposed to violate that. With all of his power, there were divisions of things that he could do, things that he could not do. And he chose to step over one of those boundaries, one of those separations. It says, then Azariah the Cohen with 80 valiant priests, Kohanim of Adonai, followed him in. How'd you like to be one of those guys? Following the the king when he's going in, when he's not supposed to go. Says, they opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to Adonai, but for the Kohanim, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated, to burn incense get out of the sanctuary for you have acted unfaithfully you will have no honor from adonai elohim that's a pretty strong statement i mean we we sometimes in our pride in our haughtiness sometimes our leaders don't need to have yes men all around them all the time right they need to be spoken uh what's true not what they want to hear And these guys were speaking, you don't need to be pulling, you don't want to try doing this. This is going to end badly. It says, then Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand, he was ready to burn the incense. Now, what happened in the past in the Torah when uh, some of the sons of Aaron tried to burn strange fire? (laughs) Zap. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. They did not live. He was ready to do the same thing, unauthorized fire. 
And while he was raging at the at the priests, you know, says, you know that's a the term has the idea of boiling water or just foaming. So while he was raging at the Kohanim, Tsarat, this leprosy broke out on his forehead right in front of the Kohanim in the house of Adonai beside the incense altar. And that's one of those another example of why the whole idea of leprosy, Tsarat, is connected to the holiness and the presence of God and that evil speech. Right? He is raging, he is he is screaming at them. And then the leprosy breaks out right on his face. Right beside the altar. And then it says, When Azariah, the chief Kohen, and all the other Kohanim stared at him, behold, his forehead had the Zaharat. And it's almost as if he was in such a rage that Uzziah didn't even notice this situation. But everybody looking at him did. And so it was no longer a matter of, you know, hey, king, you don't need to be in here. You don't need to be doing this. Now what do they do? He had, they had 80 people with him, right? And they pretty much ushered him out immediately. They rushed him out of there. Indeed, he himself hurried to get out because Adonai had smitten him. It goes on, it says, King Uzziah had the leprosy, had Zarat until the day of his death. And he lived in a separate house with the Zarat, for he was cut off from the house of Adonai. And Jotham, his son, was in charge of the king's house and governed the people of the land. That's that co-regency type of thing. It was his pride. It was his haughtiness. It was his arrogance. That whole, you know, how dare you tell me what I can and can't do attitude that led to his downfall and continued decline of the nation in spite of the good things that he has done. And, you know, the nation kind of followed his lead. Isaiah, he's witnessing all of this. He's witnessing how it can change. Back in, in verse 5, in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 5, he says this, of how things can change. He says, as long as he, talking about Uzziah, as long as he sought Adonai, God made him prosper. But when he started doing his own thing, that's when it started causing problems. First for himself, and then for the nation. And this statement, you know, as long as he sought Adonai, God makes you prosper, is that going to be true for every king? Every leader, every nation, every people, if we are genuinely, truly seeking the Lord, is he going to bless that? Yeah. Unfortunately, as long as he sought the Lord, as long as he sought Adonai, that's the exception rather than the rule. Most of human history has seen you know, kings, presidents, pastors, and other leaders that are not seeking the Lord the way they should. But in, in Isaiah's heart, in what he is trying to communicate to the people, he is longing for a day and a time you know, he is desiring to create even in his readers a longing for the day when the Lord truly rules as king in, in place of all of this imperfection, of all these imperfect ones who lead their people and their nations in decline. Isaiah shows his people what a true king should look like. Then that year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord, he saw Adonai, sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And so seraphim were standing above him. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. One called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Adonai Zavaut. The whole earth is full of his glory. So then the posts of the door trembled at the voice of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. This is what the true king looks like. 
This is the perfect king, the one that we are all waiting for in the messianic era. You know, even as the nations decline, we should never lose sight of this is where we're going. This is what we are waiting for. He is Adonai Tavot, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies, and his forces essentially are flanking his throne. In many ways, this parallels what happens you know, at Mount Sinai with all of the, the shaking and the smoke and the voices and the loud sounds. This is what I think, you know, Yom Kippur in its fulfillment will look like. The Day of Atonement is going to look like when Messiah is on the throne in glory and the nations come before him. He's in this position. He is seated on the throne and he is there to judge the nations, to hear of their either their loyalty or as what he talked about back in chapter 1 uh, about their rebellion. He is there to either receive them into his service or to reject them. Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of Torahlessness. He is separating the sheep from the goats when he is seated on the throne. And he'll say in that day, that's what he's talking about. If if he rejects their, if they refuse to be loyal to him, that's where he says, depart from me. You who reject my Torah, you who reject my rule, you who reject my reign, depart from me. See, it's in his presence. When he is there on the throne, we are standing before him, that all of us are made acutely aware of our condition, of our sinfulness, of our need for the king's mercy and grace. That's what, that was Isaiah's reaction. Then I said, Oi to me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. He's acutely aware of his sin. And what was it that, that, get, that started with Uzziah, the king? What made the leprosy appear on his face, his head? Well, it was out of pride, but it was when he was raging, when he was speaking against the priest. He says, I am a man, I'm dwelling among a people of unclean lips. I am a man of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, Adonai Tzavot. He could have leprosy appear on him just as easily, couldn't he? Just as easily. And it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a glowing coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said behold this has touched your lips your iniquity is taken away and your sins atoned for to be in the king's presence to see his face our sin has to be atoned for but notice here who provides the means and the mechanism for our atonement it's not isaiah he's not bringing any sacrifice he's not bringing anything for himself it's there he's making not an offering at all the altar is already lit you know it's like as if the sacrifice has already been prepared and accepted because adonai himself has provided the offering the lamb was slain when before the foundation of the world there in that heavenly tabernacle you know that that situation where atonement has been made, it applies across time. The king provides everything. The seraphim goes to the altar and touches his lips before he even can ask. The king provides everything. He gives grace and mercy. He gives good gifts to his children. You know, Isaiah described God's provision you know, for his sons, for, for Israel and Judah in this way. He also unfortunately described the results. In chapter 5, he says, Let me sing of my beloved, a song of my beloved about his vineyard. He says, my beloved had a vineyard in a very fertile hill, in, in, uh, almost like a, a garden or something like that, a special 
place. It says, he dug it out and cleared its stones, planted it with choice vine, built a tower in the midst of it, and even cut out a wine press. He expected it to yield good grapes. But there's the result. Is it yielded worthless grapes. See, the Father, He knows how to do all the good things that His people need. He knows how to give good gifts to His children, of which the Torah is a part of that, even as Romans 7 talks about. Even the Torah is holy, the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Yet in spite of all those good things that He did for His vineyard, His choice vines, they still are producing worthless and that term there can also be stinking or poisonous grapes. The kind of thing that you can't really do anything with. And then as if, you know, he says all of that in, uh, in Isaiah, then as if to try to get the point to across to a people who, who might not be getting it, who might not be perceptive or bright, I don't know if y'all ever noticed that. Has that ever happened to you when you've been, you're talking to somebody and, and, and you're trying to tell them something important and they're just kind of looking at you with this stare like, what? I don't get it. That, Vicky has that happen to me a lot. You know, she, she looks at me and she's like, he's not getting it. But to, to communicate to this people who's not getting it, he says, you're producing these worthless grapes, this vineyard, so now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. I'm talking about you, but I want you to make the decision. I want you to figure out who's in the right here. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? Why then, when I expected it to yield good grapes, did it yield worthless grapes? This reminds me of that moment in the life of King David. You remember when Nathan the prophet shows up before him? This is after Uriah had been killed in the, in the account with Bathsheba. And Nathan the prophet shows up and tells the story to David about this wealthy man who has all these sheep and the, the poor man who has just the one. And one of the travelers, one of his friends, the wealthy man's friends shows up and instead of taking one from his large flock, he takes the, the one from the poor man. Remember what David, how David reacted to all of that? Whew, he was ticked off. He was angry and started pronouncing all of the judgment that should befall that, that rich man who would do such a terrible and awful thing. He pronounces judgment against this guilty man in the story, like the vineyard. All the while, David himself is the one who's guilty. And Nathan calls him on it, right? You, know, you are the man. This is that whole thing. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? You know, what is the verdict? It's, the verdict is nothing. He couldn't have done anything more. He has done above and beyond what they deserved. And so what is this vineyard owner justified in doing? He goes on, verse 5. So now I will make known to you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge, and it will be eaten up. I will break down the fence, and it will be trodden down. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also command the clouds not to rain on it. Do you think Isaiah liked delivering this message or sharing this with them? This has not been easy to even prepare and think about in light of all the things that have been going on the last few weeks. The whole sense of, does it seem like the hedge has been taken down in some respects? He says in verse 7, For the vineyard of Adonai Tzavot is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah, the planting of his delight. He is just spelling it out for them. Guys, you can't, I'm not going to let you think that this is 
you know, just speculation that this is just, I'm just telling a cute little story here. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. The justice and the righteousness, that's the good fruit. The, the stinking, poisonous fruit is the bloodshed, is that violence. Because when Messiah, when the true and good king, when he is on the throne, it's going to be a lot different than this. He's not going to lead any decline. He will lead his people to the true greatness that he has promised. Because it goes on here in chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Adonai Tzavoth will be exalted, will be lifted up, enthroned, essentially, in through justice. And the holy God consecrated through righteousness. Those things that they were the vineyard was lacking, he's going to establish. He will be exalted. He will be raised up. I saw the Lord. I saw Adonai high and exalted. That's how he starts it. He will be exalted through righteousness and justice, judging even his favored, even his chosen people by the standard, by the standard of his Torah. And the interesting thing in all of that, he is holding his, his own people to the standard of the Torah. But then what does he do? He also holds all the nations to the same standard. He expects even all the nations to learn and live by the same way of life as Israel and Judah. Chapter 2, this is a passage that we sing about, that we look at all the time. He says, it will come to pass in the last days, you know, when he is high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the world gets to witness all of it. He says, in those last days, that the mountain of Adonai's house will stand firm as head of the mountains and will be exalted above the hills. And so all the nations are flowing to it. And then many peoples will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Adonai, to the house of the God of Jacob. Then when they get there, they're going to be taught. He's going to teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. Are they going to be taught the same thing that Israel and Judah are taught? Are they going to be walking in the same way that Israel and Judah are walking? Yeah. For Torah will go forth from Zion and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. And so the rule and the reign of the messianic kingdom spreads everywhere when they are taught the Torah and when they begin to walk in his ways. It spreads over all the earth when his word, both the living and the written word, the rule of that king spreads over all the earth and all the nations will stand before him. Just as it talked about in chapter 6, all nations, when they stand before the king, are they going to need his mercy and atonement just like Isaiah did? Yeah. See, the only way that Messiah Yeshua is of any benefit to all the nations is actually for all the nations, for the Gentiles, is if the Gentiles are held to the same standard as the Jewish people. Because the solution, the atonement, the payment is the same, right? It's Messiah's sacrifice, isn't it? Isn't that the payment? Isn't that the solution for all of our sin, both Jew and Gentile? The wages of sin is death. And sin is defined by what? God's Torah, his instruction. Sin is the breaking of the Torah. All the world, Jew and Gentile, are pronounced guilty by the same standard. But why ever hold them guilty to a standard that he never expected them to hold up to or participate in at all? If that were the case, if the only solution to their guilt uh, of those expected to live by the Torah is the atoning death of Messiah, then you'd better hope that God holds you to that standard so that his sacrifice applies as well. If he's not holding you to that standard, then his offering to make atonement 
doesn't matter. Not to you. His sacrifice only makes sense in the context of the Torah. And if God has a different standard or way of life for non-Jewish people, then it would make sense that a different offering would be required. But there is one mediator between God and man. The man Yeshua, the Messiah. And all nations are held to this same standard as his people, as the Torah, as the word, the living and written goes forth from Zion, as all nations stand before the true and perfect king. Because he goes on to say he will judge between the nations and decide for many peoples. The standard that he's judging by is his word, is his Torah. And they will beat their swords into plowshares, their violence that we talked about earlier. What's supposed to happen with that? done no more of that their spears into pruning knives nation will not lift up sword against nation nor will they learn war anymore he will truly be the prince of peace who has brought and enforced peace upon all the nations and if that's the future for all the nations then he keeps appealing to his own people, he says, come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of Adonai. Let us walk in that hope. Let us walk in that future. Because he's going to finish the work of purging the dross out of his people. He's going to finish the process of, of making them holy. He's going to finish the process of sanctification. Because not only does he redeem and save us, he cleanses us. Because this is the only way to avoid declining as a people and a nation is if he begins to change and cleanse us and restore us. A restoration of his word in our lives. This is what we should be looking for in trusting in Messiah. Chapter 4, verse 2 says, In that day the branch of Adonai will be beautiful and glorious. That's talking about the king. And the fruit of the land will be excellent and appealing for Israel's survivors. It's not going to be uh, uh, stinking and poisonous and worthless anymore. And so it will come to pass that whoever is left in Zion and whoever remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among them, among the living in Jerusalem. Verse 4 says, After Adonai has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and has purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Verse 5, Then Adonai will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her convocations, her feast days and holy assemblies, a cloud by day and smoke and shining of flaming fire by night. For over all glory will be a canopy then there will be a sukkah for shade by day from the heat and for refuge and for shelter from storm and from rain this not only pictures the mountain you know the beginning of things right at passover and such with the mount zion and the cloud by day and smoking fire and such but it also has the sukkah it also has the wedding for over all, glory will be a canopy. Y'all know what that word is? It's chupa. That's the canopy over the bride and groom. After all our sin, after all that dross has been removed and purged, that glorious marriage and covenant is fulfilled. That's what he's wanting them to see, wanting them to never lose sight of, because we will never, no longer be a nation or a people in decline anymore, but lifted and exalted to the place that he's always wanted to bring us and always wanted to take us. You know, back in chapter 1, he says, Afterward, you will be called city of righteousness, a faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice, her repentant with righteousness. That's the whole picture of, of the new Jerusalem from Revelation 21. And when this happens, when we finally get to the goal that Isaiah 
is always wanting to his, his readers to see and keep in mind this, this, this future kingdom. It's that one king that is to rule them all. That's where he's going. That's where he's wanting them to picture this. The great thing is, you know, with that, this is the one king. This is where we're going. You know, the great thing is, is we don't have to wait for some day off in the future for the king to start ruling in our lives. For the great and glorious and exalted king to rule, we can pledge our loyalty to him. Even now, and I know that most of you have, we do, we pledge our loyalty to him by faith. We confess, we declare, we proclaim Yeshua as the Messiah, he, that he is Lord. We acknowledge like what Isaiah did, that we are men and women of unclean lips standing before the king, helpless to change, helpless to offer anything of value that can fix our situation. And so we believe that the offering of Messiah, of Yeshua's life, was an acceptable atoning sacrifice. And that was proven by the reality of his being raised on first fruits. Believing that God raised him from the dead. And so we are redeemed. We are saved. Our sin is atoned for. And he receives us under his rule. This, that gospel kind of message is what Isaiah is trying to preach and share with his readers. And the message has not changed message has not changed if he is the same yesterday today and forever it's in the past it's in our present it's in our future it's where everything is going to the rule and the reign of the king in spite of all the decline that we see going on around us none of this decline is going to survive but it's what he is going to do in making us holy as his people. Amen? That's what survives. That will be the glory. Father, we...